and it was mentioned already, but in verse 30, I want to read this portion of scripture. Actually, we begin in, uh, yeah, let's go into verse 30. Jesus said, go into the village opposite you, where as you enter, you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. He said, loose it. Somebody say, loose it. That's where we're believing God for this, this week. That things will be loosed in people's lives. Someone say, loose it. He said, loose it and bring it here. And if anyone asks you, why are you loosing it? Thus you shall say to him, because the Lord has need of it. I want you to look over at your neighbor this morning and tell them, just look them in the eye and say, hey, donkey. <laughs> the Lord has need of you. <laughs> so those who were sent went their way and found that Jesse had said, and but as they were loosing the colt, the owner of it said to them, why are you loosing the colt? And they said, the Lord has need of him. Then they brought him to Jesus and they threw their own clothes on the colt and they set Jesus on him. And as he went, many spread their clothes on the road. Then as he was now drawing near the descent of the Mount of Olives. This was a two-mile journey that he made into Jerusalem. The whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory to the highest. Before you're seated, give your neighbor a high five and tell him the Lord has need of you. The Passion Week is the crown jewel of our faith. This is the week where we as believers offer the Lord our, our highest in every area of our life. We give him our highest praise. How many love to praise the Lord? We give him our highest commitment. How many are committed to the Lord? We give him our highest in everything that we do because this is the crown jewel of our faith. This is the week where Jesus came to change the course of history, and while doing it, he changed the course of our lives. How many have been transformed by the love of God? And, and I want to say this to you, is that Jesus, he didn't come just to start something new, but he came to shake what was already there. I believe that there's a shaking that's going to take place in people's lives this week. I believe that religious people are going to be shaken. See, the religious won't shout on it. The Pharisees won't shout on it. The Sadducees, you see, they're sad, you see. They won't shout on it. But Jesus didn't just come to bring a new thing. He came to shake what was already there. That's what revival is. And what you'll find in the Passion Week, this is so important is that every day that Jesus spent in Jerusalem represents something he desires to do in our heart today. Every miracle, every story in the Passion Week, somebody say passion. Every story you read in the scripture represents something he desires to do in our heart this week. That's how I'm going in. I'm saying, Lord, this is not an ordinary week. This is not an ordinary time. This is a special time. This is a time where you want to wake some things up. You want to shake some things up. You want to turn some things around in my life, in my family. And I'm believing for two things this week. Number one, I'm believing for renewed passion. I'm believing that believers would be renewed. I'm believing that the church would be refreshed. I'm believing that someone who's been stuck will get loose. Say something to me. I'm going to say it one more time. I'm believing that somebody who's been stuck will get loose by the love of Jesus. And the second thing I'm believing for is salvation. I'm believing that this week God would draw people into his house so they might be saved. 
So many things happened during the Passion Week. On the first day of Passion Week, which was, I believe, a Sunday, we see here that Jesus entered the city. And when he entered the city on this coal, it was the fulfillment of an ancient prophecy. A parade began to form on this two-mile journey from the Mount Olives into Jerusalem. A parade began to form because of the expectations of God's people. As was alluded to earlier in Zechariah chapter 9, the prophet said, Rejoice greatly, O daughters of Zion. Shout, O daughters of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming. Look at your neighbor and tell him the king is coming. And, and how many of the kings will come, you, you ought to get happy about it. Because when the king shows up, he brings all his blessings with him. He said, they said they were rejoicing. They were expecting. They said the king is coming. And he is just and having salvation. And this is the fulfillment of the scripture, lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. So all the people, they believe that this is their moment. And they begin to cry out, Hosanna in the highest. You, you'll find that just in a short time, they'll go from saying Hosanna in the highest to saying crucify him. Why are people so fickle? Why are people up one day and down the next? Why are people praising the Lord in one season and cursing God in the next? See, the king is here. The king is coming. That's what they're saying. The king is here. The king is coming. But what you will find is that Jesus did not come as they expected. He did not come as they anticipated. He did not come riding in on a stallion. He did not come in with a physical army as David came into the city of David, into Zion, when David brought the ark and he brought all of his mighty men and thousands of people followed him. That's what they expected him to come. Jesus did not come with a physical army, but he did come with a heavenly host. Israel was looking for a king, but Jesus already knew he was king. Israel was looking for a king, but Jesus was looking for the lost. Something's shifting in the room already. Israel was looking for a ruler. Jesus knew he was the king of kings and the Lord of lords, but he came looking for broken people. He came looking for the infirmed. He came looking for the sick. He came looking for the women that had been rejected, that had sinned. And they said, hey, you'll never be accepted. You'll, you'll never be forgiven. But Jesus came looking for the least of the least. He said, I've chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. That was Sunday. Then on Monday, Matthew 21, 12, Jesus gets to work. Whew, that's what he's going to do this week. Hey, he gets to work. Tell your neighbor, get to work. He goes into the temple and he begins to deal with the house of God. How many know judgment begins with the house of God? If anything good is going to happen in the world, it's got to happen in here first. If anything good is going to happen in your home, it's got to happen in here first. He, he goes into the temple and the Bible says that he turned the tables of the money changers in the temple and those who were selling doves because the religious leaders, you got, you got to beware of religious people. The religious leaders had turned the house of prayer into a house of personal gain. Woo. I believe that this is a week where somebody's priorities are going to be turned upside down. <laughs> because when you let God turn you upside down, you can turn the world inside out. Jesus went into the temple and he began to deal with the money changers, overturned the tables. The leaders had turned the house of prayer. He said, my house shall be called a house of prayer. But the religious leaders had blocked the worship of God's people. They had chained the people down. They had begun to put a price on worship. My goodness. I don't have time to get into it, but they began to put a price on worship. There was no liberty. There was no freedom. Come on, somebody. I thank God for a church full of freedom. Because the Bible says where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. I wonder if there's anybody here that you know what it is to be free, to worship your God, to lift up your hands, to shout. Come on, somebody. 
they blocked the worship. And Jesus told the woman at the well, he said, God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship him in spirit and in truth. So a lot happened that week, Passion Week. On Tuesday, the next day, in Mark 14, 3, there was a significant event. And it was so significant that it's mentioned in all four Gospels. When Jesus was in the house of a Pharisee, some say that he was in the house of the leper that he had healed. And what you find about that leper is that he actually went from being healed to being religious. Come on, somebody. How, how quickly do we forget where we came from? How quickly do we forget the healing? How quickly do we forget how he broke you out of prison doors? How many think I'm not going? How many say I'm not going to forget this week what Jesus did for me? And there he is in the house of this leper with these religious Pharisees and a woman, the Bible says a sinful woman came into the room where the Pharisees were and his disciples and she came in with an alabaster box and in the alabaster box was an expensive oil. It was a spicknard. It was a very fragrant oil. And what we find is she comes behind Jesus at the feet of Jesus. And you can look into the scripture. Some say it was Mary. Some say it was a different Mary. But what the Bible says is that she was sinful. And she came in to the feet of Jesus and she broke open the box. And she began to wash his feet with her tears and wipe his feet with her hair. I wonder if I got any grateful women in the house this morning. And as she began to weep over him and begin to wash his feet with her tears, the religious people begin to judge her. Come on, somebody. And Jesus said to them, he said, when I came in, you didn't offer me any water. You didn't offer me any hospitality. But this woman came in with a fragrant oil and she broke the box and she began to wash my feet and to wipe my feet with her hair. And what we find in that very moment is this sinful woman begin to demonstrate what real worship is. You're going to like this point. That real worship is not a song, but real worship is a sacrifice. And when this woman broke open that box, there was a fragrance that filled the room. There was a fragrance that could not be denied. You can always tell a worshiper because there's a fragrance on a worshiper. See, some of us used to smell like some stuff. I'm going to get victory outreach on you right now. You used to smell like smoke and you used to smell like marijuana and you used to smell like chemicals. Some of you smell like that green bottle of brute. Some of you drank that green bottle of brute. But when you're a worshiper, there's a fragrance that comes out of your life. It's the fragrance of mercy. It's the fragrance of grace. It's the fragrance of uh, gratefulness. And is there anybody here on this Passion Week that can get grateful? And because of her sacrifice, the Bible says that it upset the religious people. One thing I've learned about times of God's power is that people who are upset with their sin begin to make people who are not upset with their sin uncomfortable. That's why if you're here and you got things going on in your life and you have not dealt with it, expect to be uncomfortable because there's a fragrance in the room. There's a worship in the room. Why are these people so grateful? Why are they shouting? Why are they jumping? Why are they leaping? Why do they clap their hands? Why do they smile? Why do they dress so nice on Sunday morning? Because there's a fragrance when you begin to worship the Lord. There's a sound. There's a, there's a scent that comes out of your life. And when you begin to release that fragrance of worship, expect that people will judge you. 
You see, that in that moment, they begin to plot against Jesus. And the reason they plotted against Jesus is because Jesus didn't honor the religious leader. He honored the broken woman, which is a picture of the people that Jesus has come to die for. He said the healthy don't need a doctor. He said it's those who are sick. Come on, somebody. See, this woman is a picture of a people that Jesus came to die for. Those who have been broken. Those who have been despised. Those who have been beaten. Those who have been marginalized. Those who have been pushed aside. See, every religious leader had forgotten what God had done in their life. And the Bible says that on that day, someone say on that day, that's when the religious leaders turned up the heat. Because on Wednesday, there was a day of silent betrayal. Come on, somebody. There was a day of silent betrayal. There was a day on that Wednesday where Jesus did no miracles. He just taught his disciples. He just spent time with them. But the religious leaders were up to no good. In fact, that was the day where Satan himself actually started to prepare the heart of Judas. If you look a little deeper, that was the day where the religious leaders sought not only to kill Jesus, but to also kill Lazarus. It's funny how religious people, they always want to kill the miracle. I got healed. Well, what did the doctor say? preaching pretty good this morning. Look at those Pharisees. Look at those Pharisees. Plotting against Jesus. It was there that Satan began to work on the heart of Judas. The Bible says that Judas was angry because they had felt that the oil that that woman had poured out on Jesus' feet had been wasted. So, but, Jesus, but Judas wasn't really angry about the oil. What Judas was really angry about, what the real reason he was angry, was the fact that Jesus was not who he wanted him to be. <laughs> Beware of people that are always trying to turn you into what they want you to be and not what God called you to be. Jesus' reign was not about earthly power, but heavenly power. And the religious leaders plotted against Jesus, plotted against the master, plotted against the saviors because they were looking for David. They were looking for somebody who would subdue their enemies. Jesus came and said, love your enemies. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. God, I feel hearts are being torn up. I feel like this week, God's going to do an inner working in somebody's life. He said, love your enemies. Bless those who despise you. Bless those who speak bad about you. They whipped him. They pulled his beard. They spit on him. They put a crown of thorns on him. They mocked him. They put a piece of plywood on the cross and said, this is your king. They tried to take him down, but when he was down, that's when God brought him up. And the same way that Jesus came up, in the end, God's going to bring you up. Come on, somebody. Look at your neighbor and tell him it's time to love. It's time to love the unlovable. It's time to reach the unreachable. It's time to teach the unteachable. It's time to heal the sick. It's time to restore the lost. It's time for the prodigal sons to come on home. It's time for the prodigal daughters to come on home. It's even time for the jealous brothers to change their heart this morning. This is Passion Week. This is the week where God's going to stir your heart again. This is the week where God's going to wake you up. This is the week where God is going to do something fresh. He came to shake up what's already there. Thursday, Mark 14, 22, was the day of separation and sifting. See, Jesus knows. He knows. He knows who's with him. 
and he knows who's not with him. And on that day, this is the day of communion. This was the day of the Lord's Supper. This is the day where he instituted the Lord's Supper. And he says, it's not about religion. It's about relationship. And when he began to talk about breaking the bread, with the, which was his body, and the blood, which was, his, which was the very life that would flow from the cross, he began to turn some people off. It was in that moment where people who were religious could not understand the message. He said, this is the blood of the new covenant which is shed for many. And he said, assuredly I say to you, I will no longer drink of the fruit of the vine until that day, watch this, when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. In other words, when everything shifts, something's about to shift. We're going to shift from religion. We're going to shift from doing things in the flesh. We're going to shift from doing things out of ritual. Come on, somebody. We're going to shift from doing things because we have to. We're going to shift from relationship, and we're going to start doing things under the new kingdom. There's going to be a new kingdom, and it's going to be sealed, watch this, by the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. There's no longer going to be a requirement for a lamb to be slain. He says, I am the lamb that was slain for the sins of all mankind. And when you drink of this blood, you are a part of me. You have a relationship with me. See, Jesus wants to move his people from religion to relationship once and for all. And then on Good Friday, that's when it all took place. And we'll be coming together on Friday. And we'll be having a time of communion, of commemorating the death of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let me tell you what, what, what about Good Friday. That's the day that the devil thought he had the victory. That's the day he thought he had won. How I many of the devil's a fool? Because on Saturday, it was silent in the earth. It was dark. A darkness came over the earth. And it was silent on earth but there was activity in the heavenlies. And the Bible says that the Lord Jesus, come on now, he didn't go to heaven according to Ephesians. He went down to hell. Come on now. And he went down to hell and he had a little talk with the devil. And the Bible teaches us that it was there that he disarmed the enemy once and for all. All of the lies, all of the weapons, all the things that mess us up while we are here on the earth. Jesus went down and he snatched the keys to death, to hell, and the grave. And he put the devil under his feet according to Genesis chapter 3. You ain't saying nothing to me. And he began to bruise his heel with the head of the serpent. Come on. And he put the devil in submission. And when Jesus put the devil in submission, if you partake of the Lord Jesus Christ in communion if you are saved and water baptized you have the power to put the devil in his place today come on somebody and no weapon formed against you shall prosper and greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world and when all things were silent and everybody was sad come on now it was silent on Saturday, but Sunday was coming. Look at your neighbor this morning and tell him, don't be sad. Sunday is coming. I know it may not look good right now. I know it may look dark right now. I mean, I know you may feel like giving up right now. I know you may feel misunderstood right now. I know you may feel... Like things aren't working in your favor right now and everything's silent and I ain't got nobody to encourage me and I feel all by myself and I've been sick in body and the devil's been working on me and it feels like the devil's laughing at me. But I came to tell you, I got some good news. Sunday is coming. Sunday is coming. Because on that morning when those two women went to that tomb, they found that the stone had been rolled away. 
the stone had been rolled away and they encountered two angels and they said something very key to those women that I believe that the Lord is saying, he's going to say to you this week. He said, why do you look for the living amongst the dead? Why are you looking for Jesus in the graveyard? He is not here. The Lord has raised him up. He is alive forevermore. And because he's alive, you got the victory this morning. Because he's alive, you're going to make it through the storm. Because he's alive, you're going to fulfill the plan of God in your life. Because, come on, somebody, why do you look for the living amongst the dead? It's over. It's a new season. It's a new era. It's a new start. Heart. It's a new beginning. Woo. And as I get ready to bring it in today, I find it curious that when Jesus kicked off the week, he came in on a young colt. According to Zechariah chapter 9, he came in on an unbroken colt, a baby donkey. I got a minute. I got a minute. I got a minute, Raj. Thank you. <laughs> I find it curious that the events that launched has started with an unbroken, immature, watch this, pure. Pure. Someone say pure. I didn't say holy. I said pure. Unlearned untamed, unbroken. And he says to his disciples, go and tell them, there's a cult there, and go tell them that I have need of it. What's amazing about that is that when you look at this young cult, it reminds me of people. That this all-powerful, omnipotent God in a great mystery of this Christian faith, has limited his ability to our simplicity. And what Jesus said is, if I'm going to be what I am and do what I can do and release what I have, I simply need a man or woman that is simple enough to believe. Why? God is saying, I need somebody who I can use for my purpose. Now, he says, when they ask you, why are you loosing the colt? Why are you taking what does not belong to you? Tell them it's for the Lord. Tell your neighbor, it's for the Lord. And in those days, just stay with me here. People were used to, to the Romans taking their stuff. It was called commandeering. And under Roman rule, they can go to anybody. If they needed your donkey, they'd take it. If they needed you to carry a bag for them, they'd, you'd have to do it. So people were used to that. And so when they went to this man asking for his colt, look at this. They were used to it. But what we find is that they asked the question, why do you need it? But they were willing to release it. They were willing to release it because the disciples were not Romans. They could have said, no, you're not a Roman. No, you're not a centurion. Why should I give you this cult? But what we find was there, a, there was a willingness. Somebody say willingness. This Passion Week, I want to tell you, nothing is useful to Jesus until it becomes loose. Jesus not only came to die for our sins, but he came to loose us. When he raised Lazarus from the dead, come on now. They said, he, it's been four days. He smells by now. He's decomposing. Jesus said, did I not tell you if you believe you would see the glory of God? He said, Lazarus, come forth. Lazarus came out, but there was a second miracle. Woo! Some of you need a second miracle. Watch how heavy it gets. Because some of you are saved and you're functioning on grace, but you have not yet been loosed. You're still bound. 
You're still dealing with stuff. You're not possessed by the devil. We all got issues. But this week, Jesus came to break you loose. He came to break you loose once and for all. As Lazarus came out of that tomb, which was a foreshadowing of the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, he said, loose that man and let him go. And I got a word for somebody this morning. It's time for you to get loose. It's time for you to get set free from addiction, get set free from depression, get set free from the things that have been plaguing you for too many years. This is your week. Touch your neighbor and tell them it's time to get loose. It's time to get loose. Loose from the world's grip. The world has been holding you too long. Secular society has been holding you too long. Worldly music, you're still bumping Snoop Dogg. It's been holding you too long. All the flesh has been holding. It's time to get loose. I wish I had a turn. It's time to get loose. You're saved, but you're not loose. You're saved, but those grave clothes have got to come off you. Tell your neighbor, let's get loose. It's time to get loose from the world's grip. It's time to get loose from your past. The past has been plaguing you too long. That failure has been plaguing you too long. That mistake you made has been plaguing you too long. That old relationship that failed has been plaguing you too long. That divorce has been plaguing you too long. I came to tell you this is your week to get loose. It's time to get loose. It's time to get loose. What's holding you? is weak and it's not strong. What's holding you is weak. Someone say it's weak. It's it's not strong. It's a lie. I I saw a picture the other day of an elephant tied to a folding chair. And the tamer had him tied to this little rinky-dink folding chair. And what you'll find is the elephant stood in his place. And I got curious about it, and I began to study, why is this elephant, all-powerful elephant, one of the most powerful animals in the animal kingdom, being held by a folding chair and a rope? And what I came to find is that from a young age, the tamer conditioned the elephant, watch this, to be held. When he was young, they tie the elephant by a chain to a pole or a tree. And what's, in reality, that elephant is so strong that he, he could easily break the chain. But the goal is to keep the elephant in his place, to keep the elephant under submission. There are some of us here right now, the reason you're not loose is because when you were young, somebody tied you up. Somebody said you'll never do it. You'll always be this way. You come from a broken family. You come from a tough background. And every adult figure or family member in your life says you're going to stay in this place. But I came to tell you this week the devil is a liar. It's time for you to get loose. What held that elephant in this place is that elephants have the biggest memory of all the animals. They have the greatest memory. They can even remember people's faces. Elephants that are tied to small things, they don't remember the chain, they don't remember the pole, they don't remember the tree. They just remember the feeling of being tied. When Jesus asked for a colt and said, loose him, what Jesus was saying is, I'm going to advance my kingdom. Hear me. Through people who are willing to be loosed. I'm going to advance my kingdom, not through religious people that know everything. You might have all the degrees and all the Bible background, and you might have been in church, and you might have Moses' pager number. But we're going into a new era, and the Lord is pouring out revival in this hour. 
When I saw that revival in Asbury that went on for a number of weeks, I saw all these young people worshiping the Lord. No music, just a little piano, a little guitar, simple, simple worship, packed out day on end of young people worshiping the Lord. It was the most simple revival. And it was in that moment that the Lord pointed me to the colt. The colt had no saddle. It had no bridle. It had nothing. It was just a baby cult that had not been conditioned and the reason the Lord wants to set you free and loose you is because he's bringing you back into purity I told you this is a big word He's bringing you back into purity. All the stuff that's been trying to stick to you, all those opinions, all those religious people that are trying to cancel out your fire. The Lord said, this week I'm bringing you back into, I'm taking the saddle off, I'm taking the bridle out. What, what we need this week is revival. Somebody say revival. We need revival. We need a fresh wind. Tonight we're going to gather together and we need a fresh wind. But you say, well, what kind of revival do we need, Pastor? We've got, our prayers have been awakened. Our worship is louder than ever. Our preaching is full of fire. We're moving in the gifts, and that's great. That's beautiful. But what we need is a revival of simplicity. See, the, see God can do a lot of things. But we tend to mess it up. We mess it up. And God says, you know what? I'm looking for people who will be pure again. That will be simple again. Jesus is coming this week. But he's not coming in on a stallion. He's not coming in on a camel. He's coming in on a baby coal. He's coming in on a young person that will submit their life fully to God. He's coming in on a leader that's willing to take all that stuff off of them and say, God, do it again. Who believes that God can do it again? He wants to do something new in this church. Oh, man, I'm preaching good. He wants to do something new in this church. He wants to do something new in your life. The church needs a revival of simplicity. Here's what we need. We need less talk and more worship. We need less pride and more humility. We, less, we need less hate, division, and judgment, and we need more love. Someone say more love. We need more forgiveness. Here's what we need. We need less performance, less showboating. Look at me pray. Look at me do this. Look at me sing. Look at me preach. Look at me. I'm posting it. Everybody look. Less performance, less showboating more connection with God more real relationship with Jesus we need less chaos we live in a chaotic world there's all kinds of chaos the world is getting worse we need less chaos we need more reverence reverence for the Lord reverence for the church reverence for our pastors now I'm not saying I feel reverence from you but reverence for our ministers, reverence for our leaders, reverence for people. We need less division, more unity, and we need less fear, and we need more faith. But the faith that God wants us to stir up this week is not an ordinary faith. It's a childlike faith, childlike faith. Someone say childlike faith. He came in on a donkey. A child, simple, pure, unbroken. I look at that donkey and I say, Lord, make me that donkey. Make me that donkey. Make me that pure leader. Make me that pastor that doesn't become skeptical. Make me that pastor that doesn't criticize everything. Well, I didn't like that song and I didn't like that thing and I, you know, you know Lord, just make me simple, man. I just want to serve you. I just remember what you did in my life. I was all messed up. Lord, I don't want to be involved in church politics and financial issues. Lord, just bring me back to my knees. Bring me back to the altar. Bring me back to the foot of the cross. Who, who could say amen? Bring me back to the foot of the cross. Make me like that donkey once again. 
say, Lord, ride me. Come on, somebody. Holy Ghost, fill me. Take control of my life. You know, he's sitting on that. Lead me, guide me. Come on, somebody. You tell me go left, I go left. You tell me go right, I go right. You, he'll never tell you to go backwards, but you tell me to go forward. You want me to gallop? Come on, you want me to walk slow? Come on, Holy Spirit. Who's with me this morning? This is Passion Week. Say, come on, I want to just be like that pure donkey. I just want to have that childlike faith. I want you to lift up your hands all over this place. And I believe that on this Passion Week, we can start in a place of repentance. This is not an altar call for the broken. This is an altar call for any person here today that says the devil's trying to steal my purity. This week, I, 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 I'm saying, Lord, give me a revival of simplicity. Bring me back to that place of the cross. Bring me back to that place of repentance. And if that's you this morning, I want you, to, I want you to just slip out of your seat very quickly and come to this altar. And I want you just to kneel down for a moment. We'll take about five, six minutes. And I want you to say, Lord, make me simple again. Lord, make me simple again. Lord, bring me back to that place of humility. I've, I've been too proud. I, I've been too proud. I've been too judgmental. I, I've held grudges in the house of the Lord. And Lord, I want a pure heart.